Pop goes the weasel. I knew it. You had this look like you were just waiting for your moment, Pete. <laughs> so anyway, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Uh, today's February the 25th, 2018. Um, 2018. I feel like I should have a flying car. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Uh, let's you don't do... have a flying car? Shit. Do you? Well, I have a car that flies. <laughs> Uh, let's do uh, short introductions and then have Nadia introduce herself and talk to Nadia. So Nadia Bolkin is our guest today. Nadia um, is the author of a recent collection called She Said Destroy, um, published by Word Horde, isn't it, Nadia? Yep, that's right. Word Horde Press. Okay. So uh, let's start with Rick and work our way over. Rick? Okay, Rick Lay, writer. Pete? Pete Rollick, Rush Chairman. <laughs> Matt? Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter, purveyor of prizes. Oh, that's right. You have a prize. What do you have? It is a paperback copy of The Strange Dark One by Willem Pugmire from Miskatonic River Press, his stories of Nerlathotep. Okay. Uh, and Joe. Joe is here, everybody. Yay. I'm Joe Pulver, sort of back from the dead, writer, editor, and still mayor of Carcosa. I feel like you should introduce yourself by saying, I'm Joe Pulver, and yes, I am alive. <laughs> uh, I survived brain surgery with, a, with only minimal complications, and I am walking around slowly. Wow. Glad to have you back on the show again. Thanks. I missed all you guys. You know that. Yeah. So, uh, Nadia, for those who don't listening who don't know who you are, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, this is probably going to be very rambly, but I guess I'm... That's a all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nadia Bolkin, writer. Um, that sounds really weird. Um, I write. That's how I prefer to say it. Um, I also have a insane um, DC consultant day job, so that's also a part of me. Um, but I write horror that I call sociopolitical horror. Um, Wait, can I can I interrupt? Yeah. When you say DC, yeah, as in Washington, not yeah. as in comics. Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, you should be clear on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just wanted the audience crowd. to understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The place that we're all, you know, the place where all the bombs are heading. That's where I live, basically. <laughs> Good way of putting it, right? Okay. So. <laughs> so when somebody uh, asks you what kind of what kind of if they find out you're a writer and they say you know that question what kind of um, I say horror. I say I, I write horror, and you they horror. always have a really weird look on their face. You know, that's <laughs> not what they any of them are ever expecting. Um, I Still, would say, it's 2018, man. No, I mean, I think I would say reaction one is really horror. Like, why? Or like, I don't, well, I don't do horror. That's too scary. And then the second reaction when they actually read something that I've written is usually, um, oh, you actually are good. Or like, <laughs> you can actually <laughs> Well, that's nice. It is nice, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you you are actually far more than good, young lady. <laughs> um, far. We'll discuss that as we go along. But yes, you're good. <laughs> Exclamation marks. And Matt was saying before you came on before the show what a wide wide range you have. So. I didn't want you to miss that compliment. Well, yeah, I've, I've read like, oh, I don't know, a half a dozen of your stories. I don't have your collection, but I've read in the anthologies that you appear. Yeah. And just the breadth of it, I one of my favorites, uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves, is still Red Goat, Black Goat. Yep. Oh, yeah. Which originally appeared in the Innsmouth Free Press. And I got to say, one of the reasons that I really liked it was its setting in mm -hmm. Indonesia. And I was hoping you would use that as a kind of segue to tell us about that part of you. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, so I'm half Indonesian. I, uh, my father was Javanese and, uh, we grew up or I grew up, um, in Jakarta, the sprawling 
humongous capital city of Indonesia. Um, my mother was into Javanese dance. She's originally from Kansas, but um, immigrated over. Um, and that's how she and my dad met, et cetera. Long story short, um, I lived there until I was, I guess, almost 11. Um, and then the nation collapsed, <laughs> basically. Had a little, little collapse. And at the same time, my father passed away. And so both of these things happened in very close conjunction with each other. Um, so then we moved to Nebraska, which, you know, if you, um, I think half the stories in She Said Destroy are Nebraska and half of them are Indonesia. Um, with a couple sort of like imaginary places in between. But those are the only two places that I feel comfortable like writing about that are real um, because I've lived there, you know, for years. And I feel like I sort of have an, an understanding of the setting. You know, I'm, I'm one of those writers who's very like, like I've never been to Paris, so I'm never going to set a story in Paris. It's just, I, I need to feel like confident in what I'm in what I'm writing, I guess. So, and, so do you speak yeah. any other languages of Indonesia? Yep, it's Indonesian, basically. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, you know, luckily it's actually a very easy language to learn. Um, but yeah, I try to work it in as much as I can without sort of being, being conscious of like too much is too much, you know? Um, but yeah, try to get a little bit of the, the local dialect in. I have a friend who's from Indonesia. She's of Indian descent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she speaks like four languages. She said they just spoke them all in her neighborhood when she was growing up. Um, like, yeah. uh, Mandarin, uh, Hindi, English, and uh, some other dialect that I don't know. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, it's, it's an extremely diverse country, which was part of the reason that it has so many problems. Um, but it's also what makes it sort of unique and great um, is the strength of its, you know, religious and ethnic and linguistic diversity. Um, but it's a super, super challenging place to govern, as you can probably imagine. Um, so the Indonesian language is actually like a created language um, that was based off Javanese, which is the, the ethnicity that rules Indonesia. Um, but it's like a simplified version of that. And it's taught to everybody, all the school kids and everything. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really interesting experiment in like nation building which is super sort of poli sci geek of me, but that's that's what my that's what I went to school for is political science, so apologies for that. Well, you were speaking of places and uh, as a proud Iowan I have to point out that you did Oh yeah. <laughs> I remember this conversation where you were like, Yes, you set the story in Iowa. <laughs> I was like, not, yes, uh, well for those who don't know, uh, Autumn Cthulhu that I edited, I invited Nadia at Joe's urging to uh, be in the book. And she wrote a story called um, There is a Bear in the Woods. And I'm reading it and I'm loving it. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, this has to be included. And in, in, in not because she said it in Iowa too, which is just basically the icing on the cake for me. So <laughs> so that, that was nice. Yeah, so. my only exposure to Iowa is driving through like the Council Bluffs area to get to the casinos. <laughs> So, you know, so that was a little bit of a risk on my part, you know, setting well, that up. There's more to it than that, but we won't <laughs> bore everybody with that topic. <laughs> um, what, what's the inspiration behind the title to the collection? Yeah, so um, good question. Honestly, like I had played with a lot of titles, um, you know, when I was thinking about maybe pot potentially doing a short story collection and nothing really clicked. Um, but um, she said destroy is, is a title of a song by death in June. Um, and I use a lot of song titles uh, because I am really bad at titles. Like I am so horribly <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> bad, which is why like, you know, I use campaign slogans, you know, for there's a bear in the woods. I use song titles. I use, I mean, anything you can think of that doesn't require me to come up with my own catchy phrase. Um, so uh, there is a bear in the woods. That was a campaign slogan. It's a Reagan campaign. Oh, that, it's that's a Reagan. right. Reagan, Reagan, Reagan. Yeah. 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 And, but, you know, but I, I do, I use song titles a lot myself, but that's because so often I find the title of a song gives me an idea. Mm. So rather than search for the title, it's like, well, that's where it started anyway. 
Um, yeah. Is, I do is it that in, how it hits you or? No, I do it in reverse. I usually like, I have the whole thing um, thought of, and then I, I search through like, I have like a document that's like list of titles <laughs> and it's all not titles that I came up with. You know, it's all like song titles, etc. like ad campaigns. Um, and then I just find one that fits. So a lot of times it doesn't really have, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, whatever you want to call it, a secondary consideration, I guess. Well, often uh, writers will use the title of one of the short stories as the title to the collection. Right, and I did not do that. Yeah. yeah. What What are your thoughts on that? You just. Um, I just not... I the title. I mean, I, like when I when I yeah. finally like hit upon the title, I was like, this wraps up everything that I want in like the short story collection. Like it's about, you know, it it's it puts the gender thing like right up top, which I thought was really important because that was one of the real like ways that I put together the collection was I wanted it to be about gender issues. I wanted it to be about like young women's voices and it had destroy in it and agency right like she is saying destroy um which i thought was like just perfect for what i wanted to get across um so yeah i didn't really need to have a have a story uh, reflect that well on that same note what about the the it's a very interesting cover can yeah. you talk to us about the cover and the and the artist who created it yeah. Um, so I was, um, you know, I was looking for, for art, you know, and this was like before I even had a contract or anything. Um, but I, I sort of had this idea that I wanted like an image of um, a woman, but in sort of a battle-esque um, setting. So like a helmet, you know, some kind of headgear that would signify her as like, um, as being, being a soldier, essentially. Um, and so we found... Um, well, or I found I found this artist whose name is skipping me right now, but if I can find it, I will get that. It's it's probably in the collection, right? At it, the is, beginning. it is. It is. I feel terrible that I'm I've got it in front of me. No, it's, my mind blanks like that all the time. It's yeah. yeah. Um, Between is I think one of let's one see of cover art by Catherine Longhurst. There you go, Catherine Longhurst. Yeah. Okay. So she does all this like super um, interesting like Soviet depictions um of like it's kind of like a mix of like soviet pulp um and like the like propaganda art um and i loved it, it you know it was like a great sort of you know i i felt like there was kind of a kinship there of like writing about sort of cultures or using like art about cultures that aren't really are sort of tangentially related to you and i don't know anyway i loved her work um and so when um, when time came to talk about covers, I said, how about this one? And I submitted a few suggestions and um, my editor contacted um, Catherine Longhurst and she was fine with, with having us use it. So that was great. Um, and just for those, I don't know why, I don't know why I echoed there all of a sudden. Here, let me see if I can fix it. For those who um, want to look up the artist, it's Catherine, K-A-T-H-R-I-N, Longhurst, H-U-R-S-T. So, yeah, it's a very interesting cover. So, um, yeah, I, I love go ahead, propaganda. I'm sorry. That's all. Like, if I could, like, fill my room with, like, propaganda art, I have, like, some that's, like, Vietnamese, <laughs> and some that's, like, American, you know, like, the contrasting styles. Um it's really, really interesting to me. Um, like what images like inspire people to, you know, how can you get people to like take up arms, right? And usually, and women are usually a huge part of propaganda art, right? Like either they're like getting the men to go or they're saying, I'm going to sign up myself or either saying like, protect me, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, listen, I, I obviously am not going to go through every story in the book um, and ask you this question but i'd like to for a couple if that's okay yeah, of course. Uh, about your inspiration for them um the, the five stages of of grief what was the inspiration behind that story that was one of my favorites oh thanks um so i i think the inspiration for that was basically my own i was i wasn't you know i was doing a lot of grief therapy of my own um frankly at that time um I was in a, in a grief group in college. Um, so we talked a lot about that. Um, and um, 
I think for a long time, my fiction was very much oriented around losing people and what happens to the survivors um, and this process of loss and healing and um, which is a very sort of like traditional horror theme, right? Like the whole idea that you can't let go of someone who has died and mm-hmm. that prompts you to make all these terrible decisions like using Ouija boards and making deals with demons and all these kinds of things. It's like a very common prompt. Um, and, you know, that was one of the things that I, 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 I did a lot of that when I was just starting um, to write horror um, because it was sort of the closest thing sort of closest outlet I had to horror. Um, So it was very much about, you know, this idea that you have to let go um, because memories of people um, who have passed on, like if you can't, if you can't sort of separate yourself from them, it turns rotten um, because you're forcing sort of an unnatural stop on a natural process. Um, And, you know, I was dealing with a lot of sort of issues of like clinging too close to memories of my dad and sort of having to, having to sort of like divorce myself from that and, and become my own person. Um, You know, I became a political science major because my dad was a political scientist. So there were a lot of these sorts of issues like percolating in my head. Um, So that's, I think kind of where it came from, but you'll see that like, I mean, you'll see as if you're going to like investigate (laughs) my early stories, (laughs) they're all like about death. I mean, just about, the loss of some someone in a family. Um, I, 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 it took me a long time to write about anything else. Uh, before I ask you about the next one, can I just say, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, it was just the impression that I got mm-hmm. that your stories seem to take place in this on planet Earth, but in an uh, alternate Earth, because a lot of the characters, they, they accept these paranormal events as mm-hmm. just part of everyday reality. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think that that is, that is largely true. Um, and that's probably partly because like I grew up in a country, Indonesia, where um, people do accept strange things as par and course for just daily life. Um, you know, everybody has a ghost story. Everybody has like seen a ghost. Everybody has been like, knows someone who's been hexed. Um, so it's, you know, nobody sort of blinks at that. You know, like people will come into your house and say like, oh, the spirits here are, are good. And you're like, oh, okay, great. Thanks. Like, I didn't really want to know that there are <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You know, like, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just accepted as just a part of the fabric of reality. So I think that I, you know, I'm, I'm okay with writing, with writing that way. And it also just kind of like, it helps when you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're trying to get across a story that's a little bit, you know, crazy. Um, if you if you if you allow your universe to just accept that some of these things are real, you know you can skip all the sort of like, oh my god, it, really? Like it's a ghost, you know? Like which you that's a in, great like, point. <laughs> yeah, it's like a time saver if if people accept <laughs> that like there are ghosts. <laughs> that's a great point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, only unity saves the damned. Mm-hmm. I think if I had to pick a favorite story in your collection, that would be it. And it struck me that as I read the story that it would make a great horror movie, you know, Uh, I mean, it would trans, it would, it would, it would transfer to the screen, adapt to the screen easier than perhaps some of the other stories, which is not a criticism, of course, but this seemed, I, I I just read it and I thought this could be a great horror movie. (laughs) I would love to see that happen. Um, Yeah. Because it's, it's actually about like people faking a horror movie, right? Like, right. Right. Footage. It's about these these uh these teenagers who decide to cash in on a local urban legend um by basically faking footage, um, which of course is what people do with urban legends, right? They fake Bigfoot footage and Loch Ness monster footage, etc. But in this case it's a ghost. And um so they have like one of them like dresses up as the ghost and all this stuff and as you can imagine, when you do things like that in horror fiction, it never, you know, that, that just doesn't, that's not going to end well for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but because of that. Um, Don't you know you're in a horror story, man? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's funny, like my, 
I, my roommates and I talk a lot of, we watch a lot of horror movies and we talk a lot about like stupid decisions, you know, and like, like, this is just, you're just goofing, you know, like by doing this, you are goofing, you are walking into the basement alone, like why, 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 why? And this is, this is a story where I would say like people goof, like these teenagers should not have done this. Um, but you know, yeah, I, is at the same time it's something that people do you know like especially now in like the sort of social media age like people want to get famous and you know people make viral videos and you know you look at things like the all those gosh i can't even remember the name now but like the slender man series you know right yeah and like clearly that's not real right but they are pretending it is so, you know, I th that was kind of what, what made me write that story was like, okay, if you want to play with that kind of energy, you know, maybe it's going to play back with you. <laughs> and, right. and what is that going to do? Um, so, yeah. Now, she's a ghost, but it, there's part of the story that I highlighted. Mm -hmm. um, these trees, uh, one character's talking to another. These trees, they connect all the planes of existence, the world of the living with the world of the dead. The witching tree is our cosmic tree, mm -hmm. which maybe it's because I have a Lovecraftian sight. I don't know, but it struck me as, as sort of Lovecraftian or cosmic horror, you know? Yeah, and it was written for a Lovecraftian anthology. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, it was written for uh, Letters to Lovecraft. Um, edited by Jesse Bullington. Um, and, great, great book. Yeah. Um, so it was, yeah, like that, that was intentional. Um, don't worry. That was not your illusion. Okay. Um, and, and part of what, what I was trying to do there was like this idea that these teens are trying to use this video to like get famous and like leave their hometown, you know, sort of transcend their hometown. And yet their hometown has this magical tree um that you know connects all the planes of existence and is basically saying you are always going to be part of this town um no matter what that's kind of like that's that's sort of the the sort of bleak conclusion of this whole saga is this idea that like you're connected to something that you may not be connected you may not want to be connected to and you cannot leave it you cannot you know the more you try to cut it out of yourself like it just expedites your your death and in and your eventual like reunification with that thing yeah. which i guess is a little bit sort of cosmic horror uh i'd like to ask you about one more and then whoever else wants to ask nadia questions please do jump in uh but the story and when she was bad mm -hmm. uh the, the clue it seemed to me that the inspiration at least part of the inspiration behind this was the first three words uh, the final girl yeah you know, yeah right the la that right. last really virginal really good girl right. in the movies who doesn't yes. die because yeah. she's so good and the others are not so yes. <laughs> but uh it had a nice well i shouldn't i should not say anything about the plot at all but what well, was that your inspiration was there more inspiration yeah. than that yeah i mean that was that was kind of the framing conceit um but um i mean frankly that was probably one of the most autobiographical stories I've ever written, which is not to say that I have any of those things have happened, but I was like, you know, like I was the good girl that never, you know, you know, I was extremely like obedient and all of those things. Um, and so like, I always saw myself as the final girl. Like I was always like, no, oh, that would be me, you know? Um, <laughs> like i don't i don't make i don't make those mistakes like i i would i might live you know um but the story was very much about like what is it actually like to be the final girl like in real life um is it really all that it's cracked up to be you know um so it's a lot about sort of like undoing um kind of stereotypes and preconceptions about um femininity and different kinds of femininity um so yeah that was that was a really sort of it was a very angry story, you know, I think. It was one of my, my angrier stories, um, but which you can see if you read the story. Um, it's, there's a lot of, you know, final girls have a lot of sort of pent up aggression inside them. That was kind of my, my conclusion slash my theme, which, you know, is that saying something about me? Like, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, part of the reason that I 
part of my sort of like goal in writing horror is like I wanted to put people that looked like me and like girls that I knew and went to school with and was friends with um, on the page because I never saw us, you know, um, that was like, so that was, that was like a real, a real sort of goal that I continue to hold um, because I, I do think that representation is important. And, you know, that, that was, that was a story where I was like, this is, this is me. And, you know, so every time people um, point to it, it always makes me happy because like, yay, you see me, you know? Well, on the topic of this is you, um, you know, every once in a while when you're reading, you come across a line that really resonates with you and you think, wow, this is me too. Um, mm. And I don't want to get too personal, but it, it, with you, but the question, the, the line was, I just think it's such a beautiful line. Could people be born lonely? Um, yeah. I just resonated with that. I th just thought that that was beautiful. And you know, what follows it is, it was beautiful. So. Well, thank you. I'm glad. Um, that Joe, anybody, right? what's yes, that? I have a question. You go ahead, Matt. Okay, so you've got this um, for the short period of time that you've been publishing, um, and as young as you appear to me, you've got this very impressive resume of short stories. I was wondering, are you dabbling in any other forms? Like, for example, are you writing a novel at all, or what's on the horizon? Sure. Um, well, <laughs> funny you should ask. Um, I have been, let's just say, like, I've been trying to write novels for many years. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've i written a lot of really terrible ones when I was really young. Um, you know, those the kind that you're like, oh, this was really, really bad. But it's good to get the experience of just, like, writing something that long, I think, even if it's terrible. Um, but right now I'm actually going in kind of a different direction. I don't know if we want to actually go into that right now. Um, oh, but... oh, sure, you can trust us. We won't share it with anybody. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> Nobody's watching or listening later. Right. Um, so I'm sort of, I'm, I'm trying my hand at nonfiction right now. Uh, my next project is, is nonfiction and non-horror. Um, so it's 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 a totally different direction and it's really kind of terrifying for me to be doing it because you know everybody's like oh you know your next thing you know horror novel <laughs> and i'm like yes but i'm not doing that at all so um you know the the good girl in me is terrified of that um of breaking that rule um but i am breaking it so 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 what it, your expertise is uh politics it appears so uh what are you writing it's actually not about politics either. Um, it's actually about sport and sport fandom, which I bet nobody was expecting. No. But nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition either, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's completely... So I'm, I'm going in a little bit of a different direction. I'm just going to so, see if I can make it. For like so before we, leave, before we leave that, how did you yeah. get into writing about sports fandom? Because there's got to <laughs> so, be something we're not seeing on your bio here. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's totally random, right? Um, so I'm a huge sports fan, um, which I think if you know um, Nebraska, that's not so strange. Um, Mike probably has some sense of, of what that's like. I don't know if Mike's a football fan or not, but Nebraska is like a sport crazy place. Um, uh, I'm not a fan of really, I'm not a fan of sports at all. My wife is... No. No. Is a big fan of football, and she she explains football to me when we watch a game. So yeah. that tells you anything. So yeah, um, it's a little strange, and and it's very much like I have like my I feel like I have like my horror world, you know, and then I have like my political world, and then I have like the sports world. Um, You're complex. It, it's three things I'm pretty passionate about. Um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm just I'm a huge sports fan. I'm like an adrenaline junkie, um, and so I'm writing a book about the experience of being a fan of an individual sport, um, which, you know, you've got all these books that are about like, yeah, I'm this lifelong Chicago Cubs fan. I'm this, you know, follow this basketball team around, you know, I'm this sort of like this, it's, it's very much about like nationalism. It's very much about like the community of being, um, you know, you're like born into it. Right. And you're like part of this like army of your neighborhood. Um, and being an individual sportsman is very, very different. It's more like being part of a religious cult, I would say. 
Um, so there's a little bit of a horror link there, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's what I'm, that's, that's sort of, it, it's something that became sort of like super important to me over the course of the past year. And so I just decided to, um, yeah, to pursue that. Well, I have more questions, but Joe, you want to jump in with a few questions or comments? Okay. Yeah, sure. Well, all right. Let me make a couple comments first cool. because um we uh, at this point you mentioned how her range which i think is fast but i just wanted to read some um blurbs by other people of note okay um you have to give me a second because it's hard for me to read Nadia Bolkin writes prose like a scalpel, deftly slicing to the beats of hearts of her characters and the dilemmas as they the dilemmas they confront. Impressive in subject and setting, these stories range far and wide through literary and cultural history to find the darkness that threads through the modern world. As substantial a debut as I've seen and highly recommended. And that's from John Langan. Okay. Um, Langan does not throw around his praise easily. Um, no, nor do I, as, as a matter of fact. I'm, I can be an SOB about if somebody's good or not. Um, uh, I, I agree that uh, you have an amazing range. Um, your characterization is wonderful. I love your atmospheres. Um, and as I've said, you've been in a couple of the books I've edited. Um, and uh, hopefully more as time goes by. Um, but, but I wanted you to talk specifically about your story that you wrote for me for the madness of dr caligari which i i adored to no end so if you could talk about that a little bit I, i'd be very pleased sure sure um yeah so i actually um i had never seen um the movie um until um until you approached me about that story um so I took it upon myself to like, the first thing is I'm going to watch that, um, which was great. I mean, obviously I should have seen it, you know, a million years ago. Um, but thank you for, for being the impetus for me to see that movie. Um, and, you know, I immediately sort of the themes that popped out at me were the themes that I, um, that I keep coming back to time and time again, which is um, women in leadership roles, um, sort of this, issues of transitions of power um and even though and you're like what the hell like that's not in the movie but i think i think the part of the movie that struck me the most was um was the the dream of being a princess at the end um and i'm sorry i'm of course blanking on the names of the characters but the the main female character who who thinks that she's queen um at the end um and i was like so what's her you know, her view of all of this. And so I wanted to, to basically like write about her dream of, you know, she's queen and, or she's, you know, the should be queen. Um, and all of the male characters are essentially either, you know, parts of the Royal court or, um, interlopers. Um, and I think my favorite, my favorite part of that story, um, was this idea that, that the that Dr. Caligari was hiding inside the palace, inside her palace, and that he was this this threat, you know, that you know this kind of like mythical monster man um, of this of the same sense that like you know communism is a threat and you know whatever ideology that you'd no longer believe in is a threat, um, and that he was just like hiding, sort of waiting to be waiting to pounce, waiting to like sow his his ideas into her. Um, that was kind of what I was trying to, was trying to get to there. Um, but yeah, I basically just kind of wanted to, wanted to gender switch the whole thing, which is a lot of times what I do with fiction <laughs> is I, I see something that's sort of, you know, where the, where there's like one female character and, you know, 
in a mass of men and you know it's all about like her as the love interest or her as this whatever side car and sort of say okay well what's her take on all of this because you know women who are in power like oftentimes are surrounded by men and even if they are the ones who are ultimately making the decisions i mean look at like Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar surrounded by men surrounded by a military junta um you know arguably right now becoming sort of more and more militaristic in her own thinking even though she's upheld as this like symbol of democracy and human rights but she has definitely bought into some of the things that her military is telling her um so yeah it was just i it was a different gear um different take on the on the whole idea that um of of the movie but i hope that it had at least some tangential um relationship to the movie but sometimes sometimes all you can do when you do these things is like what does this make me think of right right and 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 a lot of times that's what i want right. you know um right. i don't want another carbon copy you know um well when you did your king and yellow story right yeah another you know, you, you went after the repair of reputations of all things you go to the hardest deepest <laughs> piece of work at Chambers and yeah. and that's where you screwed around to come up with another story that I love to death you know yeah yeah I mean it's kind of like for those of us who have seen um Annihilation um but just this idea of like everything is a prism right and the light is like refracted through the prism um and I, that's sort of how I see like this this kind of work that's that's you're taking inspiration from someone else, you're sort of playing in someone else's sandbox, is that it has to be, you have to be the prism and you have to refract your own light, like you refract it, you know, into your own vision, um, even if what you're taking in is is someone else's light. Um, you What you put out is something completely different and scrambled and, and I think that's okay. Um, I think that's hard for some- Oh, I, I think that's wonderful. It's like, um... I, I wrote a Laird Baron tribute for children of old leech. Yeah. And it's like, what the hell am I going to do? And it's, I always remember that in um, uh, one of Laird's tales, guys change in apartments and puts a bunch of stuff down on the corner for the trash man, these boxes. And, you know, makes sense but we don't know what he threw out mm -hmm. and that bothered me to no end just, just as a curiosity thing it's, mm -hmm. it's like because over the decades i've moved and i've had to get rid of things and it's like why you know 20 years later why hell did i get rid of that i can kill to have that now you know um so it, it's it's little pieces it's like where where a writer decides to go yeah um, you know uh, no i loved it thank you well thank you for thank you for inviting me to to, to write it I, I i adore your work i i i'm one of those like gemma files and langan and strands who've been saying this girl she's incredible <laughs> this is great you know for for a while now and uh, um well I, I mean you know you know critically how well you've been received um uh with within the community we we just all think you're fabulous so and, and look forward to more and more well actually that's another interesting kind of segue um uh, because here you have this uh very rich cultural background and then you move to a big cornfield um, and uh, now you say that you like to sit with your friends and your roommates and watch horror movies yeah. Yeah. and so there's a there's a segue here that we've got to hear how did you get into horror um, clearly you uh, have um, made some riffs off of crafty and stuff uh, so could you tell us something about that um just about horror, like how i got into horror generally yes um, sorry so, yeah i think i've always loved horror stories i i grew up with them 
And that's because Indonesians tell their kids horror stories. That is like, like what I always say is when I was in elementary school and we were done with schoolwork, we were get, we'd be given a choice on Friday afternoon. Do you want to go outside and play? Or do you want to listen to the teacher tell you a ghost story? Everybody wanted a ghost story every time. Like they didn't want to go out and play. <laughs> um, that's cool. We loved being scared. Um, and it is definitely how adults taught, you know, taught you to survive, you know, it was like, if you're going out at night and someone calls your name behind you, don't look cause it's a demon. <laughs> um, and I still, I'm like, yeah, uh, probably a demon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's definitely good to drive <laughs> traffic on that. So these, these, these are brother, brothers, grim equivalents then. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, Adults just love scaring kids and kids love being scared. And, you know, the, the, the main um, genre of the Indonesian movie industry is horror. You know, um, it's like what plays all day on Saturdays, horror movies on like the main channels. Um, so like, it's a very horror obsessed culture. Um, so I love horror movies, just like generally, I've always have. Um, I think what made me sort of want to write horror though was I mean it took me longer to like decide that I wanted to write horror and part of it was like I couldn't keep ghosts out of my stories like <laughs> like I would write stories and there would just be like a ghost like it would just it was like and I think that was partly because I was writing about death and I sort of have kind of like a magical realist sort of streak so like it didn't seem weird but I I noticed that I was like okay I am continuously having like monstrous paranormal presences you know show up sort of like even without meaning to um so i eventually was said maybe i should just try straight up horror even though that kind of freaked me out to be honest at first because i associated horror fiction with like you know kind of those like red and black text websites like dripping blood you know extreme horror kind of thing and like, you know, I really don't do that, you know, and that <laughs> um, so I wasn't sure how it would go. Um, but um, the first magazine that I submitted to was Cheesy, the Canadian um, press, um, when they were sort of doing a lot of fiction online. And, and the reason that I chose them was because their, um, their call for submissions was so simple. And it was just 4000 words dark. And I love that they just define themselves by dark because if I had a choice, that's probably how I would define my fiction is not horror, but dark, you know? Um, but anyway, it just was, you know, I, I, I think I was, I was lucky that I, that was like my, my foray in because I, I feel like I found both a community and a style of writing that, that I really like clicked with um because i think that there are there are types of horror that I, I just don't do and you know if i had tried to go in that direction i don't think it would have worked but because i sort of went in this kind of more you know i don't know literary softer you know sort of horror um kind of more experimental um that it it worked out so um yeah it's been great and you know it definitely is a better fit for me than any other speculative genre that I have tried, which is a couple. Um, so, so yeah. why Lovecraft then? Honestly, because um, there was like so many calls for submission. You know, I mean, I was an enterprising young writer, and I was going to respond to every freaking call that I could find. <laughs> and you know, I mean, this was like several years ago, and there, I remember, I think the. Innsmouth Free Press was definitely the first one that I ever made any kind of. So I think Red Goat Blackout was actually my first Lovecraftian story, and it was. I, I was, was actually going to ask where that was published because I, when I was reading it, I kept thinking, "Is this the Goat with a Thousand Young?" Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> and you know, I had done a little bit of sort of like you know, and remember, like I was new to the genre, and I still consider myself new to the genre, honestly, even though I write in it now, which is kind of funny. But um, you know, I was I grew up reading sort of you know post war literary fiction, like that's what I that's what I is kind of like my bread and butter. Um, so you know, when I switched to horror, I was like, 
I was like, okay, who is this Lovecraft guy? Like, like, and I was like reading all this stuff, you know, to try to like get me up to speed. And, um, and that was, so Sylvia Moreno Garcia, who ran in Smith Free Press, had a call out that was for sort of like multicultural takes on Lovecraft. And I was like, oh, this looks like something I could maybe do. Um, and so I basically was just like, okay, let's pick a Lovecraft monster. Um, and, um, and that one stood out because Indonesia has a lot of goats and a lot of, I had grown up with a goat story, a goat goat story um that still to this day like freaks me out and like I don't like to talk about it because it scares me um but um because of that I was like oh instant link um and so I just decided to go from there um and then like once I started doing that it was like I mean you know this was sort of at the beginning slash middle of like the Lovecraft boom of recent you know years um and so like there just kept being more and more and I just said sure you know I can do it like and, you know, honestly, like, I think that's, you know, I, I'm sure that some people who are huge Lovecraft fans are going to be listening to this and saying, this girl, like, I can't believe her gall, you know, that she, that that would be her approach to like, this, you know, guy that I revere. <laughs> um, but, you know, all I would say is that like, as a young writer trying to break into the genre, you have to go after every opportunity that you have. And you have to- You know what I would say to that, Nadia, I apologize for interrupting, but anybody who would think that, I mean, Red Goat, Black Goat, it's hard to believe that that's your, that was your first published story? It was my first Lovecraftian story. First Lovecraftian story. Yeah. It's, Early in it's an amazing story and it's really, really creepy. It's, it's a great story. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I always I always sort of, you know, I have concerns about how like, you know, faithful to like the Lovecraftian vision I am, you know, and I especially in this sort of like, kind of environment of like, are, are women getting sort of, you know, are we just being called in to like fill quotas and all this kind of stuff? I always feel like, oh, am I like, am I doing any of this justice? You know, I, I worry about that. Oh, we don't want to so you don't kind of we don't want to read the same kind of stories over and over and over, though. Yeah. Um, no, right everybody's going right. to take we, it around and break it into their own pieces and make something new of it. It's like some people will lose interest. Some people will do it because they see an opportunity. We'll just take what it's get. We, we prefer great prose to anything else. So, right. right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, ha we have decade after decade after decade at this point of Lovecraftian literature. Yeah. What what we're all desperate for are new voices and new takes. It's like um, plus Lovecraftian lit literature or or cosmic horror has has expanded its borders substantially. Yeah. And you can, I I I think you know if you, if you're a talented writer, do what thou wills. Right. Um. And you do, and you do it incredibly well. Um, you might here and there get some purists, but everybody does. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I've read criticism of Laird because right. people don't like his take. You know, don't read it then. Change the channel. That's what Laird will right. tell you. Right. Yeah, you know, um, I, so I, I for one love his take as well as a number of other people's yeah take. Um, right. But I, I'm you know I'm 62. I've been reading this stuff since I was Lovecraft since I was 15. Yes, I love cosmic horror. I want some new shit. <laughs> you know, it's like. Yeah. That's what pushes my button. Mike right. and I, over the years, have had tons of conversations, private conversations. He's the same way. We've read mountains. It's like, hey, you know that little valley way, way over there? What, what's in that? Go tell me about that. Um, so, no, you're, you're doing a, a great job. Okay. Um, and if you occasionally get a naysayer, uh, there's a couple of words, and right. you can probably guess from a New Yorker what those two words are. That's what I'd pass along. Right, right. 
no, I mean, I don't, don't worry. I don't lose sleep over it, but you know, I am conscious that, you know, there are differing views within the community about, you know, but I mean, that's, that's, Hey, that's, that's the community for you. Well, you know, <laughs> I get smiling complaints from my listeners and viewers, but I keep adding to their TBR lists, you know, right. to be read lists. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to add another one because she said destroy is just great. Um, it's available in print for Kindle uh, on Amazon. I'm sure it's available at wordhoard.com as well. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely read it. So it, uh, you, you said that you would classify ideally your fiction as dark. Do you see it as, quote, weird fiction? Um, I think some of it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are definitely elements of, of weird fiction that I identify with and in some ways I think is more reflective of reality than, you know, quote unquote, realistic fiction <laughs> or, you know, anything else. I mean, I think, I think for me, like the best thing about weird fiction is, is this the open-ended question, sort of like the open door um, that you don't quite even know how to walk through. Um, I think that, I mean, if I think about like, you know, the sort of like the big questions that haunt all of us, you know, like, where do we come from? Why are we here? What comes after death? Like all of these things. I think that weird fiction is actually probably the best way of addressing that because I think we don't have any fucking idea. And, um, yeah. and I think the sort of the flexibility around that um, is great. Um, you know, but I wouldn't say that everything I do is weird fiction. Um, but I, I do think it's like, it's a great sort of like, you know, melding sort of genre, which I always like. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, and, and that's another one that's like, I, I am not somebody who like, I don't know, dwells too much on classifications and, um, and genres just because I am just not that kind of a person, but yeah. I don't know if that's what I would say. I would I would still say dark, um, just because yeah. you know. But yeah. Um, what are some of your favorite books that you know? If you had to list, say three or four. Oh God, uh, I got that. And if terrible. I'm putting you on the spot, ignore the question. I can go to the next question. <laughs> Lord, okay. So okay, I actually have one book that is like I I have, I have a couple that I would say are like my favorite books right now. Okay. I think it's one of those things that like fluctuates over time. Right. But the one that keeps popping up as like it really changed me um is A Sheltering Sky by Paul Bowles. And that is a good example of what I would say is kind of a weird fiction novel that is not classified as such and nobody would think of it as such. Um but has huge elements of the weird, of the uncanny, of the unexplained. And at the same time is talking about, you know, themes of like, sort of like very sort of human themes of politics and um, culture, but at the same time, just like huge, I don't know, like, what is life? Like, who am I? Like, what is identity? Um, what, what's it about? I haven't read this book yeah. and you're really piquing my interest. Have you read his, sh have you read Bull's short stories as well? Oh, I, it, do, do yourself a favor. Yeah. I love the sheltering sky, yeah. but I pr actually prefer okay. the short okay. stories that the end and the topic. What you're talking about, yeah, is even more, more expansive in the short work. I yeah. mean, sheltering sky is a novel. He he has the whole body to 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 expand. But the short works, he's bouncing all over. Yeah. Just giving us taste. And he's trying to pluck gems out when he's in tight confines. Yeah. And I I think Bowles is a magician. And give yourself a massive hug for saying Paul Bowles. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so Sheltering Sky is about, um, it's about this couple that decides to go to Northern Africa. They're, they're Western, like I can't even remember, American, I think. Um, and, you know, they're sort of on this journey to find themselves. And 
as you can imagine with journeys to find oneself, you know, it doesn't all go as planned. And they have sort of a set of like increasingly bizarre sort of interactions with the world around them. And I, I don't want to say too much because like there's a huge couple plot points in the middle that happen right. in the course of the entire plot. But it, it just, it's an amazing sort of um, idea of like people who just get lost, like just immensely lost in the world. And I, th I guess as someone who, um, you know, I grew up in multiple countries and I have sort of this like expat experience. Um, you meet a lot of people like that and you sort of see yourself, um, you know, you're sort of like, God, could that have happened to me? Like, could I have just like taken this kind of this wrong turn at some point, you know, gone with the wrong person, decided to go to the wrong town, you know, didn't go to the doctor, spoiler alert. Um, and like, just kind of went completely, you know, off the deep end. Um, and, you know, I think I, it's one of those those books that like really sort of is about like how big the world really is, even without, um, and that's even before touching like the fact of like that we are like this planet within this like cosmic space, which it does get into that as well. There is a sort of like cosmic horror element to the end of Sheltering Sky, especially. Um, but like, it just shows how very, very small we all are. And, you know, we like to live as if we have this like control over our lives, but you know, it's, it's a big world. It's a messy, wild world. And, um, and I think it's only getting more and more that way, you know, with globalization at all. Um, but this is, this was actually set, you know, in like the 50s or 60s. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a great book. Um, so recommend you check it. I, I definitely have to read it based on that. Did, did I don't you know. Ever I don't know movie? how many collections are out there, Nadia, mm -hmm. but this one, okay, which is just the, I think is brilliant. Can you it's read just, the? Can you read the name joke for the people who aren't watching? They're just listening. The stories of Paul Bowles. Um, let me see if I can tell you who edited it. Introduction well, well, by Robert Stone. Doesn't list the name. Editor. Um, it's a substantial book, um, no. but for the Bowles fan, for short work, it's a great, really wonderful overview. I love okay. that you just had that, Joe. I'm sorry? I love that you just had that, like, ready to go. <laughs> well, I, 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 I have two A shelves. But right now, because of the cataracts in my eyes, I, I can't see well. So it was like, it took me a minute to read the spine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I love Bowles. Well, I actually have Paul Bowles' CD where he recites, he reads a lot of his short stuff. If you've ne have you ever heard his voice? Uh-uh. Oh. Uh. Okay. He's like your grandfather who's a philosopher. Right. He's wonderful. You should be able to listen to some of it, some Paul Bowles on, like, YouTube. Mm -hmm. Do. He, he's what a great voice. And, um, of course, I have the film of A Sheltering Sky, which I think is a pretty good film. Um, uh, I don't re I believe it was fairly well received critically. I don't remember after all these years. Yeah, but I thought yeah. I thought they did a reasonably good job. But then again, Bowles is so rich. Yeah. A a as a writer, I, I mean there's all kinds of work that yeah, you may transform it into the, a, a film medium. But we're just you just lose stuff because there's too much flavor on these pages. Um, uh, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, de definitely do yourself a favor and, and read the short work. Um, Thanks, Joe. Read. No, I'm, I'm psyched. You know, it's like, 
like you know my stock question when we're asking about who do you like it's like oh and I, and people normally say you know horror or weird fiction writers and my question is oh who do you like outside the box right so here comes nadia outside the box to start with with a heavy hitter you know so like yay well nadia you've already said that you watch a lot of horror movies so what are a couple of favorites favorites like recently or favorites of like all time Let's do a couple well, of give them. Us all time. Give us all time. Uh, no, let, 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 I, want, I want to hear both. A couple of all time oh, and a okay. couple of movies. My all time favorite is actually The Witch. Okay. Which I'm sure everyone has seen. You know. Yep. Um, that that to me was like just like redefined horror movies to me. Um, uh, and I think that's part, partly sort of a generational thing too. You know, I think it was kind of like I'm sure that like things that you know came out in like 80s and 70s like aren't going to have as much of a punch to me I think you know but as like the witch you know so anyway I would say right. that was like my all time um more recently um my favorite movie that I horror movie that I saw last year was a dark song um oh yeah I just watched that recently yeah I watched that over and over <laughs> really I was actually sort of surprised by how much I connected with it. But I think, you know, as we were talking about these themes of like grief and loss and the deals that people make in order to have one last um, contact with a, with a deceased loved one. I mean, wow. Like that, something about that movie was so great. Um, and I think not only because, I mean, it was, it was like horrific, like the choices that were being made were horrific, but at the same time that it had, it made room for this sort of this beauty and this divinity um, that you don't see in a lot of horror movies. You know, you, it typically, it's just like you make a bad choice and you're screwed now and there's demons all around and that's it. (laughs) Um, But I love that, um, that this movie actually has so much room for just like, for a positive, a positive sense of spirituality. And, you know, and I'm saying that as someone who's like not necessarily a very spiritual or religious person, but at the same time, when, you know, acknowledges that like when we're making these deals with the devil in order to have one last contact with a loved one, you know, we're doing that out of love, right? We're not doing that out of malice. It's, It's driven by this very deep love. And I think that that movie really got that in a way that a lot of horror movies about about grief and you know and bad choices don't you know they go straight to like well you you done goofed you know like you shouldn't have done that <laughs> shouldn't have played with that Ouija board clearly that thing's not your mother like <laughs> you know um, yeah and it's, you know an endless sort of like litany into hell you know but like I think that you know it's 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 good to have this sort of like this room for for something that's a little bit just more you know more beautiful and positive and virtuous um it's an interesting it's interesting to see that in a horror movie um when when i watched that movie um i ended up thinking this is the antithesis of lovecraft yeah it's like yes the the ending was just so striking yeah Uh, yeah very striking and pete you've made some interesting observations about this movie i was gonna ask you to talk about One of the things I love about this movie is that it actually their magic isn't easy yeah you know magic yeah. is a commitment magic is damaging magic hurts you and pretty much everybody around you and you can screw you can think you do it right and you can screw it up very easily and mm-hmm. that might be the best thing that could happen right you know the worst thing that could happen is that it actually does what it's supposed to do right um right. you know if you're going to summon an angel or a demon to intervene for you to bring a soul back from hell or heaven or wherever that should be damn difficult otherwise everyone would do it you would set up shop on the corner and say you know seance is here right you know, 50 bucks and, you know you have a half off day no yeah. you know you know the purification ritual of not eating certain foods and fasting and building the salt the salt ring around the house yeah and making sure that it's you know on a regular basis making sure it's intact these are this is a really good example of of 
why magic and that's to me that's magic realism that is Definitely. this is sorcery done right yeah yeah and you know you go back and you see all the why all these you know sorcerers and necromancers and wizards are crazy mm -hmm. this <laughs> one you have to be to do this stuff <laughs> and point. two once you've done this stuff it's you know it's sort of a life choice you're done yeah so yeah. yes i'm ranting a little bit but i think it's really a great counter example to the easiness of magic in other movies yeah yeah. No, and I, I think I saw something very similar in uh, a movie I just watched. Uh, it, I think it was set in Thailand, The Temple. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where she know. becomes possessed. They take the little house and she becomes yes, possessed. Yeah. The little spirit house. Yes. Yeah. Is that good? I've, I've passed it on Netflix and wondered about it. Almost watched it. It, it wasn't bad. I, I mean, I, I no. I say that because yeah, I agree. Like it was, it was what it was. It well, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a B movie. Yeah. But it had some interesting things to say yeah. about what you're willing to do. Yes. And and what you have to do. And at some point, you make a commitment, and then you're like, oh wait, no, never mind. And it's like, oh no, it's too late. Right. You, you're in. No take backs. You, yeah, yeah. You're all in, dude. Right. <laughs> I love and, love that sort of depiction of like ritual in horror yes. Like, and, and how like, and I, I completely agree, like how hard it is, how steep the price is, but it's like, you better really, really want this. Right. I mean, it's much about like, what is it that you really, really love? Like what or you know, need, you know, like it's gotta be deep. Um, but yeah, like, and and frankly, you know, I think it's, it's no surprise that that movie was set in Thailand. Um, you know, like you see that in Indonesia as well, like, yeah, there are like black magic practitioners or white magic practitioners. And the price for using that is very high. It almost always comes back to you to bite you in the ass, you know, but like you decide that like it, it's worth it. Right. But it like, you know, because of like putting all of that effort into like the ritual and the depiction of the ritual, it just like goes to show it's like it's like go, going to like the deepest parts of you, um, I feel. Um, yeah, when magic is easy, when it's just about sort of transgression and just kind of like accidentally stumbling into it, it can feel a little bit cheap. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do like the whole idea of, you know, there are, once you start something, you can't stop. Yeah. The point of no return. Right. And, you know, and the general comment, oh, what would you, you'd love her? Yes. What would you do for her? Anything. All right. Yeah. Really? Right. Really? Yeah. yeah. Said that? Okay. Just a word. Yeah. Better mean it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, if it's yeah. okay with you, Nadia, just a few more questions. Yeah, that's yeah. all right. Yeah. Uh, I like to ask this of writers a lot. What What is literary success? What is Ooh. success as a writer? What does that look like to you? What does that mean to you? Oh, man. I mean, obviously look like I, I think most writers would say that you know they want to be as widely read as they can um I mean obviously if you're not widely read, I mean if, if you're if no one is reading you it's kind of like well I mean what what good am I doing I want to toil in obscurity forever <laughs> it's just it's that is my goal yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, nobody really wants to be that, um, even though some, you know, some of us have to be. Um, and some, of course, very famous writers were that um, until they were eventually discovered and revived from the dead. Um, but yeah, I guess for me, like, I, I want to have an effect on people. I mean, I think that's like the most simple way I can put that. Um, and I want to write truth. And that's, you know, sounds very, very fucking grandiose. I know, I'm sorry. But like, you know, that's my political science background. Like, I want to write truths about like the world that people may not have seen. Um, and I think that fiction can be a force for good, even scary fiction, um, all fiction, really. Um, I, I mean, every time anybody reaches out to me and says, you know, which is is not happened a lot but like anytime it does happen you know when someone says like this 
story helped me through a dark time in my life for whatever reason that means more to me than you know just about anything because that is a huge part of why i think a lot of us write is to sort of reach out that hand into the darkness you know and and pull out somebody who's stuck in it um because i think a lot of us have been there um and writing is a way to like connect with others by sort of it's it's like you standing with a loudspeaker you know on a cliff saying you know i'm here i'm listening to you you're listening to me it's like you know you're 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 saying like your truths and if someone hears that and it helps them that's like you know your purpose fulfilled i think um so you know yeah. that that's what i would say I, I I agree. We we may do this alone. We may do this alone in the dark. Mm -hmm. But what we are ultimately interested in is for doing a tango. I want a reader to sit in their chair with what I wrote, and I want them to be touched. Yes. Um. You know. Um. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, without that, like, why are we doing what we're doing? I guess I would say. So, yeah, 1000%. Like, it's a discourse. Um, so, yeah. What What is your experience as a female writer in horror fiction been like in the horror community? Um, well, um, you know, I... I don't have sort of... Like, okay, first, the first thing I'll say is that I have been very lucky to have been supported by, you know, more famous and influential and powerful writers than myself, you know? And I think that has helped a lot in, in making sure that I didn't just like give up and fade into obscurity, so to speak. Um, I may yet still, but who knows? Um, but, you know, Somehow and I, also, I doubt that. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't have these like, you know, like, some people I know have had, have had, you know, really bad experiences, for instance, at cons, you know, I don't have that. And I've only been to one con. So, you know, <laughs> who knows what lies ahead. Um, I think for me, you know, it's just, it's an interesting genre to be in because women are such a prominent part of it um, as victims, as monsters, as final girls. Um, and obviously women have written some of the most influential work within it, you know, famously. Um, but at the same time, like just in the day to day. Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley. Exactly. Um, but I think in the day to day of being a horror writer, it does feel like a boys club, you know. Um, and I think that's not sort of an intentional anything by anybody. I think it's more just the fact that like, you know, I mean, I, I always think to myself, like I, for instance, I work in the defense industry here in Washington, D.C., which is its own kettle of crap. But, you know, very similar sort of situation. It's male dominated industry. And it just means that when you walk into a room, you're saying, you know, you look, you look around the table and there's nobody that looks like you. And you don't have this vision that like, oh, I can see myself here. Right. Like you have to like force you feel like you're forcing your way on into the table um as opposed to i think you know a young male horror writer would probably say oh i see myself in these guys you know like i can relate to their stories i can write stories that are like this these stories speak to my experience um and and can sort of like see himself graduating into this world and you know and, and i think that's true of all sort of like male dominated industries is like that's why it's important to elevate you know like successful women in stem professions for instance so that little girls that want to be in science and tech see themselves in the future you know as grown-up scientists um there so you know obviously like it's been really great you know that like, for instance, you know, I've been able to be mentored by Gemma Files, for instance, um, because then it's like, oh, I can see, you know, a successful female horror writer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's more about that. It's more about sort of like this, you know, seeing yourself there 
feeling like you're part of the conversation. You know, I mean, I can, I can quote you a lot of studies about like women don't submit, you know, I mean, there's all these like theories, right? It's like, well, I can't, I can't publish women if they don't submit to me. Right. That's like the typical sort of anthology anthologists problem. But like, yeah, women also don't apply for jobs that they think they're underqualified for and men do. Right. So like, you know, that's the dynamic that we're working with as a society. <laughs> um, like women naturally are just, you know, not naturally, obviously women are socially ingrained to, you know, to be, to be cautious and to not, you know, to not impose themselves on others. And, you know, if you're a freelancer, which is what we all are, right. Doing this right, that is not necessarily the most successful path right like you've got to be you got to impose yourself in some ways like you've got to say that my voice is worth as much as anybody else's and that can be hard um and i think that's not just horror frankly i think i think i think horror has its weird complexities because of like the tradition of like women as victims within it you know and i think that's that makes it sort of its own kind of weird dynamic with like women then sort of like how do they write victims and you know what kind of horror stories are women supposed to be writing about you know i feel like i'm i feel like the expectation is that i should be writing about like motherhood a lot um <laughs> partly because i think men don't get that they like, don't understand like what childbirth is um and so they're like ooh, this is really scary and like horrific you know or something like that i don't really know um but like you know i don't have kids so like i can't write about that you know and i, I sometimes feel like there's sort of an expectation of like the kind of writing that women, the female horror writers are supposed to be doing. Um, but, you know, as a whole, like, I think that as the genres wants to move in the direction of being more inclusive, I definitely do feel that. Um, I think the disagreement is in how, you know, I think that there are people that, that say, you know, women or minorities um, need to earn it on their own merits kind of thing um and then there's sort of the other take that's like we need to be actively seeking out these voices in order to elevate them and i think that's that's where the discrepancy is that's where people don't agree um obviously i've been in you know female only anthologies and i think that there is merit to that i also went to a girls school like a women's college um so obviously I, I do think that there is something to be said for, you know, picking out um, voices that you, that especially like if you're in a situation where like, you know, women just don't feel like they're welcome in a genre or women just are worried that they don't qualify. Um, I, I, I do think that there is something to be said for like elevating them um, just to, just to make it more, more of a level playing field. Um, but you know, you know what's funny on that subject though is um, every everybody knows how much I love Chambers King and Yellow, mm -hmm. and I always thought you know the, the you never the, told the me, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, you know, um, Casilda's songs. Th there's the fragment, you know, and it's like Casilda, you know, it's a main character. What does Casilda have to say? I thought it was a natural for women only. Yeah. I didn't want any men in that particular volume. Um, and I was surprised by the amount of, from women, some women anyway, uh, but I was surprised that they didn't like that it was all women. Yeah. That That it's like, you are just saying, well, this is the girls instead of these are writers. Mm. Um, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I'd already done two other volumes of The King in Yellow, and they weren't 50 50 with men and women, but they were 60 40 and pretty close to that the second time. Um, I want to see as I want as many voices as I can get because you don't know what somebody else brings to the table, and I don't want to read the same old stuff over and over again. Um, but 
like I said, that that one particular occasion where I thought this is a natural just to have all women. And, and I had quite a few, a handful of women actually get a hold of me and say, uh, it makes it look like this is what the girls can do. It, it, it doesn't say as much as if it had been a mixture. Mm. And I, I confess I was extremely shocked by that. Um, because uh, I, I thought it was, I thought it was a great idea, and like I said, you know, I, I thought it was a natural, at least for that one book. I don't know if I do a second only women, right? Because I do want, I, I, I may want a particular theme, but I want as many different voices doing that theme as is possible. I think, from my perspective the problem with with that kind of um, anthology is that you second guess yourself when you think, you know, would I have gotten into an anthology if I, if it was, you know, all, if it was like, a you know, there was no gender quota, right? Like, and then you think to yourself, you know, is this, is this only good enough as a woman? <laughs> or is it like, is it good enough as a writer, right? And that's, to me anyway, the main sort of issue. Um, I mean, I've, I've managed to sort of say, fuck it, you know, basically. Um, but I think, I think that's kind of the doubt that creeps into at least my mind and probably in some other women I know. Um, that's kind of the, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's the struggle of the affirmative action, right? Yeah. Did I get yeah. into it on my own merits or not? Well, I, I only did it the once and I can't envision any circumstance where I would do it a second time. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, again, I just looking for too many different voices, you know, um, I hadn't considered that. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, probably just from the perspective of growing up female, right? <laughs> you always think like, am I being the token girl, you know, or do I have worth as like a human writer? <laughs> When, when I invite people, there are no tokens. Well, I, I, I invite people that have impressed the hell out of me. Um, I, I, invite, I was your token, Joe. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and I, I think there's a bunch of really good editors out there that do, don't do tokens. Yeah, um, for sure. Nor, nor will they. They are... Um, and, and I, I always use Ellen as, as as Datlow as the benchmark. Look at everything or anything that she's edited. Um, uh, even if you don't like a story in one of her anthologies, it's going to be damn well written mm -hmm. by a talented writer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, and. As somebody who's done a number of anthologies at this point, I, I'm very well aware of, at the end of the day, there's going to be somebody or X amount of somebody's who don't like everything. Right. I mean, there's going to there's gonna be people out there, and I've seen it, that absolutely adored a story in an anthology I, I edited. And then a handful of people who hated that story. Um, so, yep. you know, it well, just, it just comes with the turf, I think. But yeah, and, go ahead, Nadia. Oh, no, I'm no, go ahead. You're, you're the guest. I get oh, to say things all the time. No, I, I was just going to express my agreement with Joe. I mean, you know, I, it's, it's so funny. Like, um, I was telling Mike this earlier, but you know, sometimes I, I, I get like reviews that are just like, the worst reviews like of, like of, of something that I've written that I've ever read and they're just like laughably horrible um but I but part of me is like learning to like um to accept that as like you know what you made an impression on that person even if it was a terrible impression <laughs> even, even if it was like this was so bad that I had to go to the internet to write about how bad it was um you know like Hey, at least uh, at least it's it's making an impact. So you can't please everybody, for sure. <laughs> no, you can't. But there's also people on the internet 
who have to have something to talk about. Mm. And they like being negative. Yes. So if you happen to be the color that flashes that particular day, right. bingo, you're it. Right. Um, so. Pete, yeah. what were you going to say? I, I was going to say that, you know, one of the reasons we tend what, what Joe's talking about is, is, is a little bit is finding that editor that gets your stuff. Yeah. And then you end up just being with that editor forever because you, you get into this comfort zone. You know exactly what they want. Yes. And you know how to deliver it to them. Yes. So you end up becoming very comfortable. Yes. And it's, it's harder to go out and look and find another editor mm -hmm. who and then work with them and i've had some bad experiences and like, where i've had stuff that i was trying to write and it was just chopped to hell and i'm like whoa 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 that's part of the story yeah and they're like no it's not it's like yes yeah that, that's that's the core part of the story yeah. well uh, from the other side of the fence i'm got X amount of books that have a couple of the same writers in every book. Um, they were originally invited because I like their work so much. But, but I know I'm going to, I may not know what the story they're going to deliver is, but I know the quality of the work is going to be. And they're great to work with, you know? Um, and I've had a couple of writers submit more than once. You know, uh, hey, maybe there was a missing comma. It's it's a done work. You know, it's like I invited them. This is what I'd like. Whammo, you open your inbox, and then you just sit back and get a treat. And it's done. That, that's very comfortable for an editor. Um, uh, I mean, there's a couple of stories I've received over the years that I loved. And there was a lot there, but it's like, okay, let's rewrite it. Okay, and it got better. Oh, let's rewrite it, you know, and three or four times until it, I, I, it was beaten into the shape that I found acceptable. So yeah, when you get a when you get a writer that you work with well, um, that's a big positive for a lot of editors. Well, the title of Nadia's collection is "She Said Destroy" uh, by Nadia Bolkin. Um, it's available on Amazon and uh, WordHoard.com, and uh, great great stories. I really enjoyed this, Nadia. So. Thank you. Oh, and if you want to read There is a Bear in the Woods, which is a great story, it won't be in this collection, so you'll have to buy Autumn Cthulhu if you haven't bought that yet. So <laughs> There you go. So, yeah, thanks, Nadia, for being on the show and talking with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I hope um, I hope I wasn't too uh, too many details about Bali Sai in Indonesia. But... Not at all. No, you I, were great. It was great. Uh, before I let you go, I don't know if any of the other guys have seen this yet. Um, what, did, what did you, I know you've seen Annihilation, so what did you think of it? Me? I love yeah. it. I absolutely yeah. love it. Um, I was very scared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, there were a lot of, you know, I mean, I, the whole point of the movie, right, is like um, genetic manipulation and all this stuff. And I yeah, felt... No, no no spoilers, because over here it's going to be forever before I get to see it, and it's astronomically high on my list of I want to see this. It what I what I will say is what I said on Twitter, ironically because I'm so millennial, um, was that it scared me on a molecular level, like Ooh. just like uh. deep inside. I I felt like I was being rearranged on the inside, and I did not like it, and it was terrifying. Um, oh wow. The other thing that I will say is that a lot, it, it reminded me of um, the Hannibal series um, in the sense that like some of these scenes were just exquisitely beautiful, but harrowing. Like um, 
depiction like death scenes and monsters um just that kind of like super kind of dreamy dreamlike but just like this is really wrong it just feels so wrong to you as like a human being um and i have a lot of respect for people that can have you know put that vision on the screen that's amazing yeah highly recommended for me well thanks again nadia remember he she said destroy people uh by nadia bolkin so thanks a lot good to talk with you yes um all right guys i got a few other topics uh have it have any of you seen annihilation yet i haven't I haven't. I spent the weekend at a comic con. So, oh, how um, was that? Um, it's. I went in. To, so I was a guest, and I went because you know it was local. It was like eight minutes from my house, and I was going to go see three people who, during my formative years, were really important to me, in in the comics I read, and all three of those guests canceled. Oh geez. <laughs> so now I'm stuck at this con trying to hawk my books and you know it's a comic con, it's not a horror convention. Right. Um but then you know I did a panel and I talked about horror and with um Sandy King Carpenter, uh John Carpenter's wife, who's his producer. And um, a friend of mine, Adam Troy Castro, who is a, a great writer as well. And um, all of a sudden, you know, after I spoke, you know, the book started flying off the shelves. So that was good. Oh, but great. then really something strange happened to me. An artist, writer who I know of, who I've read some of his work, I'm not a big fan of. He came over and said, Pete, I've read a whole bunch of your short stories. I want to read your novel. Can I trade you art for books hmm. and i'm like absolutely and you know that was kind of cool to hear somebody come out of the blue who's an artistic talent who wants to read my stuff and who knows my stuff and wants to read more so that's kind of nice that was like the biggest shot in the arm for the whole day yeah that's great um Rick, I tried to watch Star Trek Discovery. I watched two episodes. I just couldn't get into it. Yeah. I don't know. Just so. all that Klingonese. This no, deal. that's not what it was. I just, it just wasn't grabbing me. I don't know. I, don't, I really don't even know why. So, you know. But uh, I, I, what? I know why. Okay, so. I ended up hating Voyager. Yeah. Because it relied on for the last two seasons, like every third episode was time travel. <laughs> That's a like, good thing. <laughs> I mean, the whole. Too much of a good thing, right? Yeah. The whole storyline eventually is resolved by time travel. Yes, that is true. The final and episode. that is, you know, that's. So here, you have, for, for Discovery, the whole storyline revolves around the counter, counter the the mirror universe. Well, it, it, that's not the whole story. The, the majority of the plot involves a um, sort of uh, space jumping. Yeah, and I'm just not. That's not. These were great stories in the original series that were asides. I time travel in the mirror universe were great asides and they were novelties. And it just feels like to me that, you know, Voyager laid heavily on time travel to solve its problems. And now this series is relying heavily on the mirror universe to drive story. And well, well the mirror universe was just an arc. I mean, in a way, there were two, there's the Klingon War. And then it becomes a mirror universe, and, and I think they've pretty much done that, and they're not really going back there. Mm. All right. Even though they have some leftover results from that uh, plot line. Okay. Well, I gave it two uh, two episodes. Couldn't do it. Um, there is a. I saw a trailer 
I, I'm sorry, I don't remember who posted this on the Lovecraft Easing group, the message board, but there's a movie called Black Wake uh, that looks really good, at least as far as you can tell from a trailer, and really Lovecraftian. Uh, obviously, I can't... The, 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 the trailer is available on YouTube, Black Wake. Um, just search for Black Wake trailer. But the synopsis reads, found footage film, I know, grown, but this might be done right. Hopefully it's done right, let's put it that way. Found footage film where specialists gather in a top secret facility to investigate a series of strange deaths on beaches along the Atlantic Ocean. One of the team's scientists examines video evidence to uncover a possible parasitic explanation for the fatalities, but when a determined detective, oh, there's a, just took a dip, Tom Sizemore, sends her the crazed writings of a mysterious homeless man. The, science, the scientist slowly learns that the actual threat may be more dangerous and far older than anyone ever imagined. Can she convince her colleagues of the true danger before an ancient force rises from the sea to bring madness and death to all of humanity? The final shot in the trailer is something with tentacles coming out of the ocean. So, Well, th this actually, they have... Actors who are pretty good. Yeah, uh, Eric Roberts. Yeah, you know, their career's gone B-list, but uh, still they're pretty good actors. And I think Tom Sizemore isn't bad. He might do well in this movie. Is, is this based on a short story? This sounds like something I, I read in... Uh, I think it's, it sounds like something I read in a Lovecraft anthology. I don't know, and neither do I know when it's going to come out, or if it's a direct to video or whatever. I, I just don't know. If anybody finds out, you know, email me, lovecrafteasyin at gmail.com, um, and I'll share it with the listeners. But uh, Pete, what's the name of that anthology that you did the story for where uh, Cthulhu deserts the, uh, the, deep, the deep ones? Uh, that was... Dead but dreaming too. Yeah, uh, that sounds. This sounds like a story I read in either Dead but Dreaming One or Dead but Dreaming Two. Hmm. Okay. Um, the Dark Tower TV series has found a home on Amazon. So, uh, uh, comments. They're going to have to work hard to bring people back after the movie. Yeah, should have, have been a, should have been a TV series all along. Well, I think they just they'll just have to ditch the movie, say it never happened. Well, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'll no, pretend the movie been. never happened. I'd like to pretend the movie. I'd like to pretend a lot of things didn't happen, but they did. Uh, here's another bit of news: Stephen King's score or uh, poem, I guess. I, I didn't know about this. Uh, the Bone Crunch uh, is going to be developed into a television series. So Deadline reports that King's The Bone Crunch, a poem that the horror master wrote in the 60s, has been acquired by Cedar Park Entertainment. The plan is to develop the poem into a television series. So it looks like the poem was revised and included in The Bizarre Bad Dreams. Um, an adventurer goes organizes an expedition deep into a vast jungle to locate the mythic Bone Church. I don't know. This is starting to sound a little Lovecraftian. They discover a secret not meant for the eyes of strangers. And mayhem, mayhem, mayhem. I'm assuming. So, have you? Ever, did you ever? What, did you know about this poem, Pete or Rick? Anybody? I've, I may have read it, but I don't remember it. Well, I guess it's the... This is the season for Stephen King TV and movie adaptations. Right. Isn't um, Castle Rock coming out soon? Yeah. I hope so, because it looks interesting. Um, so, uh, yeah, I want to say that I had strapped the last few days, so I was watching a lot of TV and movies, and I watched Thor Ragnarok. Um, what did you guys think? I was watching it, and I'm—I don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it, but I was thinking, 
man, this could almost be a comedy. I mean, the way they're treating this. It was a comedy. Uh, it, it doesn't come out here for a... comes out the end of March here. And this was something that was pre-ordered for one of my Christmas presents. So I got a month yet before I get to see it. Well, it's no problem, Joe. We can just give you the plot uh, uh, yeah, line no. by line. And yeah. then you won't have to watch the movie. I, I mean, let's face it, it's got Hella in it, so yeah, Joe, ha Joe has to see it for that reason, if nothing else. I, I liked it. I thought it was funny, too, which it was funnier than most Marvel movies. What did you guys think? The weird thing is, I don't want to spoil anything for Joe, but a lot of serious stuff goes down for a comedy. Yeah. Yeah, but that may be why it has to be comedic at the same time. Right. I mean, to to offset all the serious stuff. Yeah. But I'm just saying it's, you know, in some ways it's a very dark movie. You you broke up for me there, Rick. I, I was saying in some ways it's a very dark movie. Oh, yeah. Um, this is the very last day you can vote at This Is Horror. Just Google This Is Horror Awards. Um, our friend Philip Fricasi has a collection that's been nominated, um, Behold the Void. So, you know, go vote for that. Um, and S.P. Muskowski has a novel. Uh, and, um... Lovecraft Easy and Podcast been nominated again too. So, is and SP Miskowski one of our friends? I she mean, is our friend. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just making sure. I, I should have said panelist because <laughs> yes, they're both friends. <laughs> SP is watching this later, going screw you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I but I am telling people to go vote for it. So you know, hopefully that'll offset. <laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks for getting me in trouble there, Pete. Appreciate that. Uh, anyone have it's anything what you're else? For. Yeah. Anyone have anything else before we say goodbye? Um, I started watching the Frankenstein Chronicles. Yeah, on, on Netflix, right? Yeah. Um. Well, I, you know, I'm intrigued. It's pretty good. Um, there's, there's some Easter eggs that I like, uh, and you know, it, I think it's well put together. It's not as graphic as, um, Penny Dreadfill was, but I think it's a little bit more thoughtful. So I'm enjoying it. What, okay. what did you say the title was, Pete? I've never heard of it. The Frankenstein Chronicles. Okay. I think that's what it's called. It's it's uh, it stars Sean Bean as a detective in oh. you know Victorian England, and there. Well, you know he's gonna you know he's gonna die. He well, dies. In in episode one, it's revealed that he has syphilis. So there you go. He's dying. Um. But uh, it's 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 good. Um, I'm I'm really enjoying it. That the science is. Is interesting. Mary Shelley is is a main character. Um, so is sne uh, sneakily Charles Dickens. So, uh, so here's a medical trivia for you. Um, why did they call syphilis the Great Pox? Mm, to right. distinguish the rash with the rash from smallpox. Pox, right. It was just so common. Okay. Oh, well, never mind. No, it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's some similar to, like, the Black Death is, is one name for, but then there were other deaths as well. And they were just named after to distinguish them. They're like the right. head chopping off death. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, you have a prize. Yes, I do. Uh, do you remember? It is Willem Pugmire's short, shortish book, but good, uh, from Miskatonic River Press called the Strange Dark One, Tales of Narlathotep. Okay, you can be 
put in the running for the random drawing anytime this week, anytime before next Sunday. Um, I usually, if I'm if, I, if I'm on top of things, I draw on Sunday for the previous Sunday's podcast. So uh, send an email to Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com and put the subject of the book in the email and whatever you want in the body of the email and I'll randomly choose somebody a week from now. So this again is February the 25th, 2018. So if you're listening to this a year from now or something, then nope, it's too late. <laughs> Can I uh, thank yeah, please go ahead. I just want to add, uh, besides, I saw Black Panther, which is excellent, but a little aside, there is a curious Conan the Barbarian connection in the movie. In and I'm really not spoiling anything. If if you know who the characters are, they are using a character called Mabaku, who was. Uh, known as Man-Ape in the comics, but they're not calling him that because it has certain connotations. And uh, in the comics, he was a worshiper of a unnamed gorilla god, and they made that gorilla god Hanuman briefly, which in Hindu mythology was a monkey god and was only transformed into a gorilla by Robert E. Howard in uh, Man Eaters of Zimbala. Cool. Well, there you go. I can well, only uh, kowtow to your greatness. Well, yeah. everybody, thank you for listening. Guys, thanks for being part of the podcast. As always, Joe, it's great to see you. And um, Great well, to be back. We'll see everybody next time. Um, if if you want to know what guests are coming up on the Lovecraft Easing podcast, just go to the Lovecraft Easing website, uh, lovecraftzine.com or lovecrafteasing.com works as well. And uh, click on podcast. It's the very first link on the top left. And scroll down, and you'll see a list of upcoming guests. So, um, yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And um, we will talk to you soon.